Good afternoon and welcome to Webinar Wednesday. We're excited to have 50 registered attendees for today's webinar, which is eligible for one credit from the ACI. Started by giving one lucky attendee a Webinar Wednesday t-shirt for answering this trivia question. June is National adopt -a cat Month. What is the name of the cat featured in the American comic strip created by Jim David? Answer now using the question dashboard. While you're answering, I just want to webinars on our website, webinarwednesday.live, receive a CE credit. Also, just a reminder that the Expo Irvine has been replaced with three original HTM mixers. We understand that participants may be hesitant or unable to travel, so providing local regional conferences will be able to continue in education, networking, and vendor engagement in a slightly modified, less crowded and safer environment. 18th and 20th, Wisconsin with the 1st and 2nd, and California, December. Registration is open for Colorado, so for more information, please visit htmmixer.com. Okay, and let's see who the winner of our Webinar Wednesday t-shirt is. And it is Michael Swango. Congratulations, Michael. Of course, scarf. Webinar went to our sponsor, Armis. Armis is the leading agent list device security platform purpose built to unmanaged and IoT devices, providing passive, real continuous asset inventory management and detection response to prevent cyber attacks from disrupting and compromising your business world's largest device knowledge base, tracking 208 million plus devices. For more information, visit armis.com. Okay, our presenter today is Curtis Simpson, Chief Information Security Armis. Curtis, you may begin whenever you're ready. Thank you for the introduction. Good afternoon, and thanks for everyone for joining us today. So, being that our subtitle for today's conversation is dubbed the new Hippocratic Oath, let's start there. So what you're seeing in front of you right now is a bit of a play, obviously, on the traditional Hippocratic Oath. And really what this is, is teeing up the conversation we're going to have today, which is around the risk and threat landscape in healthcare, how this risk and threat landscape is being actively exploited by bad actors. But it's not a doom and gloom presentation. What we're going to dive into beyond that is how we're actually helping customers solve these challenges today, no matter how broad they are. And as we do go into how bad actors are exploiting this overall risk landscape, we're going to provide you with somewhat of an in-depth use case today to provide you with a real-world example that we've actually seen in a customer environment. And it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, obviously, scary from the perspective of these types of things that are happening in environments, but interesting and effective from the standpoint of these situations and risk can be addressed, can be mitigated, can fundamentally be solved with the technology that's available to us in the market today. So with that, as we dive into the overall risk landscape, this is a summary of many of the conversations that we have with our customers in healthcare, and quite frankly, just a good synopsis of what folks in healthcare, such as yourselves, are facing today. So at the end of the day, what it's really about is patient safety, right? What we're talking about and where, the, where this new Hippocratic Oath revolves around and really what the conversation today is gonna to revolve around is how the complexity of these environments, the devices that are in, interconnected through this landscape are ultimately putting patient safety at risk in a more traditional environment where we do not have an understanding of how these devices are communicating with traditional devices being critical care devices, communicating with things like printers and laptops and all of that within the environment because it is all one large ecosystem. So as we think about it as one large ecosystem, and we'll drill more into that today, there very much are implications in terms of patient safety. I, I know everyone on the phone today is very aware of how ransomware has been disrupting, um, disrupting healthcare overall among many other industries, but very much healthcare. And unfortunately, as bad actors like to target individuals when they're in a state of disrepair or crisis, we've also seen acceleration here in, in response to COVID. Um, data breaches, of course. Unfortunately, many of the ransomware players nowadays are not just encrypting data and then decrypting it once, once those ransoms are paid. 
they're also taking that data and if ransoms are refused to be paid, they're selling it, posting it online. And even in some cases, unfortunately, some of the ransomware players are selling that data downstream. And then of course, unfortunately, PHI data is still valuable on the dark web. So it's, it's often going to be a target even when it's not a ransomware event. And then obviously considerations around utilization and maximizing efficiency within the landscape, everything from IT devices to non-IT devices and those that folks on the, on the webinar today are very familiar with, those used for patient care, understanding how effectively they're being used, um, maybe where some are being overused, underused, such like that, understanding inventory and where medical devices are gravitating through the environment, devices are being lost, things like crash carts disappear from our customers' landscapes. And then one of the largest exposures um, that most clinical engineers and IT folks alike are concerned about is the interconnectivity, as I mentioned, of all devices in the landscape today. We'll talk a bit more about that, but generally as we look at healthcare environments, they're an interconnected web of traditional IT devices like laptops, and even traditional IT devices that are more IoT devices like voice over IP phones and printers running right alongside MRIs, patient monitors, infusion pumps. And in many cases, what we're seeing is these traditional devices being exploited. And then those attackers start to move laterally through the landscape and start affecting critical services and those devices being used to deliver that critical service. And in many cases, that doesn't become clear until those services start shutting down, patients start getting affected, et cetera. So again, very much a summary of not only a lot of the challenges that are being expressed by our customers, but the, the challenges that we help our customers solve. So let's dive into that for a minute. And I did mention that there is now a correlation, not just anecdotally, but there have been studies around not just the impact that a breach has on operations, but the impact that a breach actually has on long-term patient care and even mortality rates in healthcare environments. Very interesting, but what we're ultimately seeing is you're seeing an in, in increase in mortality in a number of these hospitals that have been affected by these breaches and overall outages. Um, you're also seeing things like the, the actual service is now taking longer to deliver, which is having a downstream impact on mortality rates and things like that. Problem is, is these attacks often end up becoming very widespread um, spread through the environment very quickly when there's something like a WannaCry type attack, move into devices that are hard to traditionally understand, monitor, respond to. So these attacks can have long-term ramifications on an environment that again have implications on patient care. Now, I wanted to, to dive into a few really important points around the research that's been done in relation to exposures um, within IT devices, but even more specifically, any type of devices, including, but not limited to those in healthcare. And the research disclosures that you see in front of you right now are actual research that was performed by Armis and disclosures performed by Armis. And the two that I wanna talk about and, the, and one we'll dive into further in a moment are CDPone and Urgent 11. And the reason is, is because CDPone, the disclosure on the left, is actually a set of vulnerabilities It relates to a set of vulnerabilities that applies to Cisco being Cisco, the networking company infrastructure, and how these devices ultimately communicate with one another in their ecosystem. The problem here is these vulnerabilities that were discovered allow an attacker to ultimately gain control over these devices. They can run remote code against these devices. And this includes everything from routers to voice over IP phones. That's important because when you start looking at urgent or vulnerabilities like Urgent 11 and you stack them up together, Urgent 11 was a finding that we discovered, our research team discovered a, around a very low level vulnerability existing within what's called the TCP IP stack um, within a device. The TCP IP stack often runs alongside an OS, maybe inherent to the OS, maybe entirely separate to the OS, in some case can run entirely um, without an OS, but the IP stack is what allows these devices to communicate on a network. What we ultimately discovered with Urgent 11 is this IP stack 
was baked into many different devices, hundreds of millions of medical devices and industrial and enterprise devices around the world. And when you combine these two, what this really means is you've got things like voice over IP phones, routers that are susceptible to attacks, whether they're the initial point of the attack or that attack moves laterally through them and starts to become invisible in them and allows them to move more covertly through an environment. But then you've got Urgent 11, which if they're able to use that network equipment to start moving through the landscape, they're then able to start compromising devices like medical devices through those vulnerabilities that exist. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about Urgent 11 and dive into detail about it today, because unfortunately, due to the complexity of Urgent 11, many of these exposures remain unpatched, unmitigated. We're gonna talk about why that's important and why it's important to look at how we can effectively mitigate these risks. So what is Urgent 11? Urgent 11 were 11 critical zero day vulnerabilities that were identified by our research team. Upon our initial identification, we identified that they were, or these vulnerabilities were specifically impacting Wind River's VxWorks operating system. This operating system is the most popular real-time operating system. And by real-time operating system, you can think about, think about the difference between a PC or laptop where you turn it on, you turn it off, and it's a very regular experience to use it when you need it and shut it off when you don't. But when you think about something like a um, healthcare services device or you think about a, th a device like an elevator, it's always on. Someone's potentially gonna come up to it almost 24 hours a day and try to use that device, consume the device. It's rarely, if ever, turned off. It needs to be available when it needs to be available, which is almost always. Um, in this specific case, as I mentioned, these vulnerabilities did not really lie in the OS, but they lied in the IP stack. The IP stack is a piece of software sitting along another piece of software, in many cases being the operating system, which is then embedded into a device. The problem is, and we'll get into this a little bit more, is even manufacturers sometimes don't realize that that IP net is on their, or that, that IP stack is on their device. And as consumers of those devices downstream, as the enterprise is buying these devices, we would definitely not know that IPNet or other specific IP stacks are running in a given device in 99% of the scenarios. Unfortunately, that data just doesn't exist in many cases because it's not regulated to exist. There's no reason to build it. Um, most of the market is demanding the devices and the outcomes they bring as quickly and as cheaply as they bring them. They're not necessarily demanding or punishing companies that are not building security into these devices. So the focus again remains on the outcomes. Now, Urgent 11 was particularly, or these vulnerabilities were particularly um, concerning and included a number of critical vulnerabilities because of the fact that they allowed for remote takeover of devices. So remote code could be executed against these devices as long as they're on the network. On the network could mean internet connected device or could mean compromised laptop on the same network that runs alongside the medical device that is vulnerable to Urgent 11 vulnerabilities. So again, going back to the fact that all of these devices are running in the same landscape. Now, Urgent 11 has a very significant impact on healthcare and manufacturing but truly has an impact on every vertical, every industry. And one of the examples I do like to give in terms of affected devices, the Mars Rover was running um, a vulnerable IP net stack. So you're looking at devices ranging from routers to medical devices, to elevators, to the Mars Rover, literally hundreds of millions of devices around the world, ranging from many different manufacturers, large and small, with many different devices used for various different purposes. Very broad because these devices are ultimately pieces. So you can think about the market ultimately shopping for an OS, an IP stack, the various different hardware components, and many manufacturers take these various components and push them all together. And we'll talk about where some of this complexity starts to create a lot more risk. So, Something interesting happened as we went to Black Hat, and I'll explain that for a moment. So the Black Hat conference and DEF CON even more specifically that follows Black Hat includes a number of different events that actually allow hands-on or manufacturers and security practitioners to work alongside one another and actually start getting into or, or work on getting at physical devices, testing theories and technologies that may allow for those devices to be compromised or affected in one way or another to help either validate that these devices are 
very hardened in that they're not likely to be compromised or more often help manufacturers identify where they may have potential exposures and then be able to work together to address those exposures. So we spent some time um, at, at um, both DEF CON and Black Hat and we spent some time on the floor working with a specific company. The specific company in this case was BD and we were looking at the specific BD Alaris infusion pump. And this actually came as a result of when we first discovered these exposures, we had, we had an assumption that because the exposures lied in the IP stack, and because as we started to dig through this, we realized that the IP stack had changed hands, it had been around for many years, various different licenses were purchased for this stack, that the likelihood of the IP stack being used by more operating systems than just the Xworks was high. But what was really interesting is we weren't entirely sure whether or not this was the case until we had more time to do further research, but because of how significant these vulnerabilities were, we needed to start working with the larger community, everyone from regular regulatory bodies like FDA down to um, groups of manufacturers and such like that. So as we started digging into these details, two very interesting things happened. We had the conversation and the engagement at DEF CON and Black Hat, and then in parallel, we had a customer reach out to us. The customer reached out to us and said, okay, you guys have released um, an update to your platform that now allows us to discover IPNet within our environment. Great, so we've, we've run that assessment or the, because your product's allowing us to continually assess for these devices, we're now looking at what devices are being found. We think you might have a false positive within your solution because the solution is identifying that we have IPNet running in our environment, though we don't run VxWorks. And at this time, our disclosure was very much tailored around VxWorks and IPNet as the combination. There may be more, but we got to dig deeper. Well, this call came in to our salesperson and the sales contact immediately reached out to our research team. And because they're a research team, their response was this, cool. The response was cool because what we had just validated was that IPNet was a lot broader. So this is the device that I was speaking of that we're actually working on um, or sitting with BD and, and testing at DEF CON. And when we were at DEF CON, what we actually validated live at DEF CON after confirming that this device appeared to be running IPNet was that it was running IPNet and some of the same techniques that we would apply to exploit these vulnerabilities allowed us to take control of the device, affect the device. Um, we shut down those conversations and started moving in a more formal, formal disclosure, right? But this was really interesting from a number of perspectives, right? Because what this got into was how broad the impact actually was. And listed in front of you right now are all of the various OSs that were used to built into various different devices that were either inherently using IPNet or were built into devices alongside IPNet and started to create this overall set of vulnerabilities across various different healthcare environments and all sorts of other environments if they were consuming any of those devices. Very complex stuff. So as I mentioned, as we started to make further discoveries along these lines, we worked very closely with the FDA, um, DHA, BD specifically to get the disclosure out. Um, very interesting and complicated process. Obviously the OS manufacturers you see in front of you for the most part here are large, they're widely consumed. They understood what we were facing as far as the vulnerabilities we discovered and the actions that need to be taken for the most part. The challenges that we started to find downstream from that were in terms of the manufacturers themselves. The manufacturers that had consumed these OSs and either the IPNet stack as part of the OS or separately, as I mentioned earlier, didn't necessarily know that they had done so, didn't necessarily have a team to respond to a research team finding issues with their product and then being able to work together and respond to those issues as a typical dis disclosure would play out. What we realized is this was even more complex than we thought, not just in terms of the devices that were impacted, but how the supply chain would manage the risk. Many of the manufacturers ultimately said that they wouldn't be able to patch. Many of the manufacturers said that though they would be able to patch, the method of patching those devices by their customers was too complex, that therefore they wouldn't issue patches, they would issue workarounds. 
And unfortunately, as a result of that, to this day, we see many of these devices still being vulnerable within environments, um, still remaining unpatched, still running alongside uh, traditional IT devices, as I mentioned, but it's not at the fault of the healthcare practitioners. It's not at the fault of any of the companies on the line. It's, it's at the fault of the complexity of this overall situation. As you have to think about patching these devices, you gotta think about, okay, how do I patch? Is it a physical patch? Is it a patch I can run systematically? Is there something that's been enabled by the specific manufacturer? Has every manufacturer given me a different solution that I have to use to try to patch? How do I do this at scale? It all falls apart very quickly, again, because we're not just dealing with one manufacturer of a PC, whether it's the Apples or the Dells of the world, one manufacturer of a mobile device, whether it's Samsung or Apple or whoever, we're dealing with many manufacturers of many devices with totally different footprints. And many of these manufacturers are not particularly mature. Some of the smaller ones can spin up almost overnight and just go to the market to buy all those components that I mentioned. Um, so what you're seeing here is really just um, a, a advisory that was issued by, um, or an advisory that was issued by the FDA as a result of the continued conversations and the overall complexity and um, implications of, and the broad implications of these vulnerabilities within healthcare environments and really warning healthcare environments to act on these vulnerabilities, start applying various different workarounds, take certain steps where if there are um, patient care devices directly connected to the internet and they don't need to be, start taking them off the internet, those types of actions. But as we see, as we look at this disclosure or even more recent disclosures like Ripple 20, which are which is basically just version 11 all over again with a totally different footprint of devices. A lot of the um, a lot of the workarounds, or more so, a lot of the guidance that's being issued by many bodies now is that you've got to continually monitor these devices and understand when they start going sideways to be able to effectively respond to these types of attacks. So when we look at what is a synopsis of the medical device security challenge, these devices are increasingly connected, as we've talked about today. No inherent security in many cases. This isn't just because the device is designed against the outcome and against the specific regulations that might, might exist for those types of devices. It's also because these devices are built intentionally as walled devices so they can maintain that outcome that they're supposed to be able to deliver. They don't want other software being allowed to be installed on them. And these are walled off devices. They don't take additional software. And even if they did, most of the, if not all of the traditional software that we use and solutions that we use to manage risk within the rest of our landscape don't apply to these devices. They don't apply to the corresponding OSs. They don't know what to look for. They don't understand the context of these devices. They were never built for the devices that we're using in our modern healthcare environments or otherwise. And we can't scan these devices in most cases. So as an early customer of Armis and as a, as a CISO on the enterprise side for most of my career, this was something that actually caused me to have to, this was one of the things that caused us to realize we needed to purchase something like Armis early because as our, as our warehouse environments, obviously very different environments, um, were becoming more and more connected and we would scan these environments to better understand our risks and exposures. What we were realizing is we were shutting down the environment in many cases. These devices were meant to do one thing they were meant to, or, or specific things, meant to ex expect specific communications. And when those communications deviate, sometimes they just fail. And if those devices are being used for critical operations in a healthcare environment, or in my case, in terms of, in terms of food service delivery, that means the entire critical service fails. Very significant, and it seems like a minor operational point, but can rapidly become a very significant point because if you're not scanning your environment that means you don't understand what exposures you have which also means you can't proactively manage that risk and then you're putting yourself in 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 sight of having to react to whatever you're facing and depending on the level of vulnerabilities that exist within landscape reacting to that that attack could be a very broad attack that gets away from you very quickly so Let's get away from some of the doom and gloom. Um, so how can you address these security challenges and still meet the mission of patient safety as the highest priority? So let's get into that. And let's talk about what Armis actually does and how we do it. Um, and then we're gonna dive into some specific use cases and the things that we help our customers find 
um, respond to and ultimately fix within their environments. So let's start with asset inventory. First, we will truly help, and we do help our healthcare customers today identify every single device running on a network. That means that any device that's communicating with other devices, whether it's an OT device, an IoT device, an IT device, it doesn't matter what it is, it doesn't matter what protocol it's using. If it's using, whether it's a specialized protocol that exists in the healthcare space, or it's a specialized protocol that's just used by various OT devices, or it's Bluetooth, Zigbee, Z-Wave, traditional wired, traditional wireless communications, we will find those devices passively by integrating with your existing network technologies and existing network infrastructure. Again, passive, not in line. If, our, if that device for whatever reason was to ever fail, you're not looking at any services downstream failing, not that that's a common event regardless, but not in line, very passive and continuously monitoring that network traffic to identify those devices and not just identify those devices, but when we step into the risk management layer, help you understand the risk you're facing with those devices. Not only CVEs and vulnerabilities and the level of exposures, just like helping you understand, are these devices um, vulnerable to Urgent 11? Are these, are these devices vulnerable to Ripple 20? We'll help you understand that. We'll also help you understand, are there advisories around these devices that may have come from the FDA, um, come from other bodies, et cetera? And are these devices compromised? And we'll get into that with our use case today, but we're giving you the full gamut of understanding, not just what the device is, but also where that device may be deviating from its traditional behaviors, where that device is deviating from the traditional behaviors we see in every other healthcare environment, and giving you that ability to not just understand that this device, yep, it's definitely communicating with a known malicious source, but more so helping you understand when a device is simply not acting right, not acting normally, and going so far outside those boundaries that you should take a look. And whether that's a healthcare device that you just need to respond to effectively, or that's a device that you wanna take offline because it's not being used for critical services, let's say a television in a lobby, Let's talk about detection and response. So we integrate with existing capabilities like the SIM solution that's being used to pull all logs in from the environment and trigger alerts or the SOAR that's being used to automatically respond to various different um, events that may be playing out in the environment or even solutions like NAC. NAC is traditionally used to determine whether or not a solution is good enough to connect to an environment. Where we end up using NAC is it still does all that, but we use NAC as a hammer. So in that case of a, of a television, a lobby being compromised, you can actually use NAC both manually or automatically in real time to say, take that television offline because I've already deemed it to be non-critical to my business. It appears to be compromised. I need to respond to it. So real time, continuous, agentless, passive, and integrated, enhancing your capabilities across the stack from left to right. So with our mission being, being to enable organizations to adopt new types of connected devices without fear or compromise by cyber attack, let's, let's talk about that. And before we dive into this, let me just say that this was my model and what drew me to Armis in the first place. My model is I realized how so many different devices were flowing into the environment regularly and whether they were a vending machine or something being used for critical business services, they were connected. But the challenge was is that there were so many devices flowing into hundreds of facilities around the world, I couldn't apply a traditional security mindset of having every single one of those devices come through my team, us assess the device, give a thumbs up or thumbs down, and let the business move. As the business has been trying to respond to many challenges around the world, they've been responding to that in an agile manner and deploying new devices and deploying new techniques and testing those things. And our mindset was we've got to allow them to do that, but what we've got to do is continuously monitor that environment for when it does go sideways, when it is potentially going malicious, when we do see malicious traffic, and we've got to be able to actively respond to that in the moment versus trying to prevent things from getting onto the network because they might eventually be compromised. I think what we're seeing through Urgent 11, as well as through Ripple 20 and all these continued exposures is that many of these devices are not vulnerable until they're discovered to be vulnerable. And that's just a mindset that we're gonna to have to continue to carry forward with us as we go forward in this digital era. 
in that we've got to monitor these things, regardless of if they're okay on a Monday, they may go south on a, on a Tuesday. So don't just take my word for it in terms of what we are able to do in the healthcare space, because specifically, um, just as of last month, or this month, we were identified by Forrester in their new wave around connected medical device security as a leader. And you see some of those reasons why um, laid out before you right now, but one of the big reasons is very much what I, what I spoke to is it is an end-to-end -end capability. We're not just helping you identify those devices that are healthcare devices or IT devices, helping you identify all of them, but then manage that threat, manage the response all the way through to that final recovery from that event. Um, and then our extensive device identification capabilities, as I spoke to, hundreds of millions of devices within our knowledge base based on up to 8,000 points of attribution, which really means that false positives are, are nearly are negligible and nearly non-existent. This is a solution that can be trusted because we've got a anonymous, anonymously crowdsourced knowledge base meaning that every time we've deployed to a new healthcare environment and we've deployed to many now we're learning more and more and more and validating how devices communicate in various different environments and aggregating that into common patterns and themes to help you truly understand what your environment looks like compared to everyone else's in your space and where you're seeing those deviations and then like i mentioned the various different device protocols being used are fully supported and provide insight into all those devices and how they're communicating over those over those protocols. And then truly, and to me, this is the most important thing about what we do, is enabling a platform that, that protects the entire landscape and enables all sorts of, enhances all sorts of other use cases and how we're trying to manage risk. So let's dive into the use cases. And this is, this is probably what's most interesting and we'll really hone in and help validate that what I say we do is actually what we do. What we do. So first, let's start with some general examples of what we found. And these are not items that we've found once. In many cases, these are events or incidents that we've seen across a number of different environments. And we're gonna dive into one of these examples today. But an MRI machine and, and many other um, critical care devices being compromised and communicating with a command and control um, service or uh, destination in Russia. We've had many WannaCry infected medical devices spreading across a flat open network and many of the um, healthcare facilities are primarily flat um, with some degree of segmentation, but many devices can't be segmented because they're running alongside the other devices that they're working with, enabling, et cetera. Infusion pumps compromised by malware while connected to a patient. Medical crash carts being used to access Facebook and various other different sites, meaning this, this crash cart wasn't hardened and it's continuous um, internet browsing to various different vulnerable sites and non-approved sites was allowing this, this um, crash cart to be compromised by traditional malware and such. And then x-ray machines and others sending patient information and, and diagnosis details unencrypted over the internet, obviously not something that we want to have happen. So let's, let's dive into one of these use cases as I spoke to. So what we're going to talk about is a is a recent project um, that we spun up for one of our healthcare customers, and this was actually spun up as a POV initially. Um, customer was very interested, very much understood the problem, knew they had these challenges, and knew that they needed to start investing in a capability like this, but wanted to, of course, as they should, go forward with a POV of a number of different products, including ours. So the project started out as an asset slash device discovery effort. So moving forward as we do, as a starting point with most of our customers, help identify what they don't know, right? Most of us don't have visibility into these different devices because our traditional solutions haven't given us this visibility. So we started with providing this visibility, um, particularly into corporate devices, then classifying those devices down to make, model, OT, IT, the version, applications, et cetera. And then helping with threat analysis around those devices. So conducting risk assessments of managed and unmanaged and non-corporate devices, identifying anonymous or anomalous or malicious activity by these devices, and then identifying the potential exposures of business. At the end of the day, just the general scope of our POV, helping you identify everything, helping you assess the risk, and then giving you a readout of what we're finding in general. So the areas of concern that were brought to us and validated th initially through conversations and even just the earliest days of the POV are here before you, right? So 
malicious domain activities have been detected by um, the IT department or the, the security group in this case. There had been a botnet hijack. They, so these, again, are all different symptoms that they've been detected or detected in their environment or they were concerned would likely be detected. Things like Urgent 11, CD Pwn, Blue Keep vulnerabilities. So again, both things that they'd seen, things they were concerned about. And then as we started moving forward with early days of the POV, started to realize that we were seeing SMB, SMB v1 traffic, which is commonly used in terms of WannaCry attacks, unencrypted credentials over the network were, to de were detected as well. Um, perimeter evasion activity was detected. Corporate devices were connecting to guest networks and vice versa. So guest networks that were normally for the dirty networks had more trusted devices connecting to those dirty networks and potentially being compromised as a result. Old OS versions were detected on the network. And we say on the network here because not just on PCs, and we'll get into the details on this in a moment, and then vulnerable browser versions were discovered across many different devices. And then we we started to see heavy port scan activity in spades. So everything you've seen in the last two slides, again, were concerns, things were already noted. And as we came up with a POV, we quickly validated all of these concerns and things that they'd noted to be true. What we also identified alongside this IT organization was that they were experiencing an active WannaCry event. And here's what that looked like. So if you look at really where we started um, just before this, this graph you see in front of you, where we started with the POV and started to validate all these other findings, these port scans were likely related to this, but that's a, it's an aside as part of the larger story. But what this security group quickly identified or started to identify is that their IT environment had been compromised and was being affected by a WannaCry attack. Now, the traditional security controls really being next gen AV or um, your agent that's sitting on your laptops or your traditional computers identified that this attack was happening. But what quickly became apparent, as you see here, is traditional security controls only picked up about 60 infected devices. We detected 15 times that number. And I'm going to get into this in a minute, but 15 times the devices that were detected using traditional technologies were detected by Armis. We were only running in one facility at this time. Um, so multiple waves were detected as they were using Armis to understand what was actually playing out in this environment. And as of March, um, or what we're really seeing here is these attacks were tied to a COVID-related attack um, that ultimately started with a COVID-related phishing event, as we've seen a lot of these start, and then rolled into what we're seeing play out here, which is waves of attacks against the environment. So this is what I wanted to get to. The reason why we found 15 times the devices, even in the one facility, with being the only facility to which we were deployed at that time, was because we weren't just looking at traditional IT. The 15 times the 60 devices all of so that difference were all medical devices so what you're seeing in front of you right now are actually just a snapshot of those many medical devices that had been affected by WannaCry within this landscape um, and what you're ultimately seeing are a whole bunch of devices that were running old versions of Windows so Armis not only identified that all these versions or all these devices were running old versions of Windows but Armis in this case because our POV started in the middle of an, of an attack that was already playing out through reconnaissance activities occurring and everything else, what we, what this team was able to do immediately was identify that, yeah, these devices are not just vulnerable, but they've been affected. They were able to map the entire environment within an hour and determine with Armis what the impact of this event was. That's obviously important from a service care standpoint, but it's also important from the perspective of if they would have responded to this event based upon the traditional, the knowledge they would have gotten from the traditional solutions alone, this event would have just continued. It would have continued to play out. It, it would have continued to have an impact. It would have grown and had a, had a broader impact than it had already because it was able to continue to move laterally from the healthcare devices, not the IT devices that might have already been addressed. So here's another example, or here's a drill in of what we were actually showing 
um, this customer in terms of the Alaris device that we spoke to earlier. So what, what you're seeing is the level of detail that we're actually providing customers around these exposures and around these findings as we're discovering them in the environment. So as we're discovering that these devices are vulnerable, um, whether it's a device that's vulnerable to a WannaCry attack because it's running an old, old version of Windows, it's a device that's vulnerable to an Urge 11 attack, this is the level of detail that you're getting. You're not only getting an understanding of um, how or that the fact that this device is vulnerable, but you're understanding why we've ranked it, ranked the risk associated with this device the way we have. Everything from what are these specific exposures to what's the likelihood of exploitability, what is the path of exploitability. You're getting those details at your fingertips because we're showing you the work around the risk so you can better understand that exposure within your landscape. So as we look at this situation, as we look at the overall risk landscape, we look at the exposures that we're facing today, we look at the types of attacks that are playing out through healthcare, we look at attackers doubling down in crisis scenarios as they unfortunately always do um, in terms of responding to COVID-19, what do we do? Where, where do we go from here? What are those next steps as an organization is looking to truly solve this? And solving this isn't managing the risk around Urgent 11 and managing the risk just around WannaCry and managing the risk around Ripple 20. It's, it's assessing and managing the risk around all those things and the next vulnerabilities that are going to come down line and then understanding the exploitation of those vulnerabilities as they play out in your environment. So hopefully as a solution like Armis, in this case, if Armis was in this customer environment earlier, what we could have identified is not just because we knew what they have, we could have helped this customer identify that IT devices had been compromised with WannaCry. We're now seeing the flow from those IT devices into the rest of the landscape, or hopefully because we'd been able to identify those early exposures in the IT environment, they were able to better understand what those downstream exposures would be based upon which which devices those IT devices normally communicate and all that, that web of complexity that is normally unavailable to teams as these things flow through a landscape. Which brings us back to the basics. What do I have is one of the most important things we've got to understand in any environment, whether it's healthcare or the environment I came from. Because if we look at this, this situation with this um, WannaCry attack, they didn't know what they had because they didn't know what they had. They didn't know how they were affected. When I looked at this in my landscape, if I didn't know what I had and an attack like this played out, that means my ability to recover the business in moments to hours was more likely days to weeks. And that same overall logic applies to environments like healthcare. The problem is, is the, the environment in healthcare actually has a downstream impact on patients, patient care, and even mortality rates as we've seen through, through some of these recent studies, if these risks aren't effectively understood and managed. So having that full asset inventory, understanding what's in the environment, how is it communicating, or um, what's in the environment, what, and not just this is a device, but this is the device, here's the risks associated with the device, exposures associated with the device, so that you can understand why do I care? And why do I care isn't just the exposures associated with those devices, but how are they being used in the landscape? And how I've looked at this historically is I know what my critical, critical services environment looks like and know what those critical devices are, what devices are connecting to them, what devices can communicate with them, what devices regularly versus irregularly communicate with them. Having that picture all the time is more important than it's ever been, but it's not something we can do manually. We've got to rely on tools to help us not only find what we've got, but help us understand what are the risks associated with those things, what's normal, have they gone abnormal, and then, because that allows us to flow into taking action, right? And taking action means we've got to have the right information at our fingertips. We've got to know what devices are impacted already, how those devices normally communicate with one another so we can start making assumptions that those other devices will be compromised, be able to take actions like isolate devices when they're less critical to our operations, having that view into that complex environment, and then all of those integration points to be able to act on that is so important and if you have it, what you have is peace of mind because you now have, it's not peace of mind from the perspective, oh yeah, the environment's perfect. No, it's peace of mind from the standpoint you're able to build a strategy around what you do first, next and last and feel, and feel comfortable in standing behind it. Whether that's on the clinical engineering side, the security side, 
or more likely that important partnership in looking at how we manage these risks going forward, incredibly important in being able to build and maintain the right strategy and to support the business strategy as they go forward and moving into telehealth and all of these other types of new or maybe doubling down on um, different types of service delivery. So coming back to how does security actually improve patient care? It does reduce risk to human safety. As we've talked about, these devices are being impacted when patients are actually connected to the devices. Some of these studies that have been done have seen direct correlations from these systemic attacks and, and responses to actually having impact on mortality rates. Reduces the risk of patient data breach, of, of course, um, which is a growing concern of anyone, whether they're, um, what, all of us are patients, right? And all of us are consumers and none of us want our data being lost, of course. Um, and reduces costs caused by non-compliance, audit failures, that one doesn't require a lot of explanation, maintains confidence as I just spoke to, and reduces costs spent on incident response. So cost obviously is in terms of impact to the environment, but also as we get into these scenarios where you look at that urgent 11 event when you don't have that visibility and you don't have a tool that brings that level of visibility, what that normally equates to is having to call an expensive third party responder to not just help you respond to the event and everything you already know and, and really augment your team in a way that's quickly understood, but rather respond to the event in its entirety and help you figure out what has been impacted. How are these attackers flowing through the environment? How should I respond to this? Being able to do that independently as much as possible has a massive impact on those costs. Having experienced those costs in the past, we're talking about a hundred, hundred thousand to millions of dollars, depending on the extent of the breach, the, the environment being impacted, never cheap, um, hard to swallow, and something that's far better to, to manage proactively. So with that, that brings us to a close of my prepared remarks, and we'll open it up for any questions we might have. Great. Thank you, Curtis. We've got quite a few questions here. The first one is, with the lack of security controls incorporated into the design and functionality of medical devices, how best can one approach the problem of how to identify, identify vulnerabilities and associated risks? Ultimately, you need a solution that understands the devices of today, meaning your healthcare devices, your IT devices, and is continually assessing those devices for risk and bubbling those risks up to you in a prioritized manner and in a manner that you can prioritize response. Um, as we talked about, gone are the days where we can use one scanning solution that scans our PCs or that we've used to scan our PCs for 20 years to also understand that risk within the landscape. And we also can't assess for those risks at a point in time just because of the fluidity of these attacks, the fluidity of these exposures. It's something we've got to look at continuously and look for those deviations in the behaviors for all the reasons I spoke to today. Okay, so what is the biggest cybersecurity threat that healthcare organizations need to be aware of given the current impact that COVID-19 is having on each and every organization? It just makes all of this more complex. The introduction of new contract, contact tracing devices, solutions, et cetera, um, particularly if their devices makes this even more complex, refactoring our environments, things like HVAC units, which are OT devices that we've got to monitor, that it become very critical to care, are devices that we don't want to be impacted um, as a result of an attack. When we look at things like third parties, um, is something else that we should make sure that we're paying close attention to. So there's the device side of this, of course, and everything I spoke to today, but many environments have various different third parties interacting with those environments and understanding those risks and potentially even looking at more modern solutions to manage their remote access, like secure access brokers and solutions like that. Very helpful and very recommended because if that attack plays out through your third party, and that third party has remote access into your infrastructure, everything I said could not only play out through the IT landscape, but actually play out through your third party landscape as well. So understanding that those that third party risk, but even more so looking at more innovative technologies around managing third party remote access will have a significant impact on managing some of this downstream risk in terms of these devices being compromised. 
Okay, that's great. So as more and more medical devices get connected to traditional IT networks, what is the best practice you have seen for how healthcare organisations can address the growing number of cyber security threats targeted at hospitals? Um, so definitely some of the things that I just mentioned, but some of the other things that we're seeing folks do is when we are, when, when healthcare organizations are bringing a new device in to roll out, um, roll out across their organization, whether it's one facility or more likely multiple facilities. So let's say, for example, um, a healthcare organizations about to consider the rollout of a new infusion pump. One of the things that our customers are doing through the consumption of our product is not just continuously assessing the landscape, but building a proactive aspect into their model where as they're bringing new standardized equipment, not things they're trying, not things that need to be spun up to respond to a problem of the moment, but things that are well planned in advance, they're actually assessing those technologies and devices before they're implementing them and then working with the manufacturers on addressing any deficiencies live based upon the data we provide before ever implementing the device within the environment, which is a very proactive solution and very much recommended as we look at not only how do we deal with the backlog of risk, but how do we manage some of that risk going forward? Okay, and, and as, as you know, active scanning is not preferred in the clinical network. Can Armis detect all of those threats without actively scanning networks? Yes. So how, yeah, okay. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so everything we do is without an agent and it is through that network integration. And as you said, active scanning cannot be executed within these environments against every device within the environment. Armis is truly what helps fill that gap. We provide that continuous assessment or continuous scanning through um, that network integration that's done in a passive manner and doesn't add really any bandwidth consumption to your environment because anything that we're shipping up to our cloud for your visibility and further interpretation is just this very small metadata um, that we've already correlated to your landscape. So not only are you getting that passively, um, you're getting that with an incredibly small footprint. Okay, so, so how do you detect Alaris OS? I hope I pronounced it correctly. So really how we detect anything is how a, how a device and its software component, components communicate over a network. So when I mentioned that we've got, and even in your opening, you mentioned we've got over 200 million devices within our knowledge base based upon up to 8,000 points of attribution, that's very much the secret sauce. So as we've looked at these devices, both from a research standpoint, as well as through our many implementations across our many customers, we've got a lot of visibility into these devices, how they operate, we've been able to build patterns around them, and really those patterns have helped us understand exactly how they communicate on networks. And as we've implemented to more customer environments, we've been able to validate these patterns again and again and again to the point where as you deploy into your landscape, we're just looking for those patterns and then telling you, you have an Alaris device, that Alaris device is still running a vulnerable version of IPNet based upon how it's communicating over the network. And even you, you're running this software on this laptop because we're seeing this software is reaching out for updates. It's actually communicating over the internet. And we can even do things because we get visibility into that. We can tell you in cases where software is not updating, like in terms of next gen AV, if it's not receiving updates, we can even provide you with that level of insight just because of the visibility into the devices and how they're communicating over the network. Okay, that's great. Uh, another question here is, when a security team combats with so many alerts generated by security tools, how does Armis help customers to effectively filter false positive? So a couple things. Um, one of the real benefits, and this is something that I did when I was at Cisco, what is integrating Armis with the rest of your stack, meaning that as the rest of the stack discovers a potential compromise event within another device, can actually reach out to Armis for attribution around the device. What is this thing? Um, what, what are the details around this device? What are its normal communications? And you can pull all of that straight into a SIM without having ever having to go with into the Armis console itself. Um, but even beyond that, as you look at how you would prioritize. One of the things that we do is because we provide you with a lens into everything, not just IoT and OT and those unmanaged devices, but IT as well. And we're providing you with visibility into vulnerabilities and risks tied to software communicating on the network on any of those devices. You can actually use Armis and many of our customers do as a risk prioritization platform when that doesn't exist in your stack. So you can 
log into Armis, you can see a view as to what are those exposures across my entire company or those risks across my, across my entire company, or what are they in Europe or what are they in London or what are they specifically in Toronto or Ontario or Texas or California or this specific um, company. We give full flexibility in how you define those boundaries within your environment. And then that gives you full flexibility into how you would potentially um, prioritize and manage those risks and provide those views, not just to IT, clinical engineering, or security and clinical engineering, but broader within IT and even other groups that may benefit from that information by giving you the flexibility to even hide and, and, and eliminate certain elements from the screen that are not interesting to some of those other parties that may gain from that information. Okay, uh, well, we have time for one quick question here. Beyond what typical IDS can detect, what mitigation can you provide, especially for this case study customer? What mitigation method was used with Armis to re reduce cyber security risk? So, number of mitigations. Some of that comes down to actual isolation of the device. Some of it comes, to, well, a lot of it comes down to that at the end of the day. What we're providing is visibility into these events going on. But here's the thing. When you talk about something like an MRI machine, you're, you're going to have some limited options, right? It's either I've got to take this thing offline and update it. I've got to take this thing offline and replace it, take this thing offline and, and manage that, that earlier risk. But there are a few things that we do. So we provide that full visibility into the landscape, but then because we provide a tactile manner of being able to create isolation on the fly, it can allow you to isolate IT assets, compromised or compromised IT assets, compromised other assets, whatever makes sense, depending on your landscape, your business, we give the ability to actually respond to it, not with all the additional details at your fingertips, but in a way that you can contain various areas of your environment where that may be challenging otherwise. That's great, Chris. We're coming up to our hour now. So I'd like to thank you, Curtis, for a great and informative webinar. And thank you again to today's sponsor, Armis. Uh, just a reminder that the post-webinar survey and certificate process is automated. So the survey link will be included in the follow-up email, which is an hour's time. Once you've completed the survey, you'll be able to download your certificate immediately. Uh, and if you have any questions, please contact us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. For information about our upcoming as a week is from July 26th to 29th. Please visit our website Wednesday. Uh, we hope to see you next week. Um, enjoy the stay safe. Thank you, everybody.